when you are a preacher, sometimes you get to get up on soapboxes. So today I am going to get up on one of my favorite seasonal soapboxes and talk about how much I despise Elf on a Shelf. So uh, Lehman can attest to this because Lehman was working in a bookstore in Toronto in the year of our Lord 2005 when the Elf on Our Shelf book, 2005, 2006, seven ish yes, we weren't married in 2005. Time uh, is a flat circle. But uh, so when the Elf on the Shelf book was first published and sort of got front row seats to watching this become a uh, holiday phenomenon, perhaps. So my feelings about Elf on the Shelf extend far beyond the years of my parenthood. And I'm actually very proud that it is one of the things that we have held firm on as parents and have not invited this uh, fake creature into our home to cause havoc in December. So if, if some of you may not know, if you, uh, you know, have not had children in the last decade or so, uh, <laughs> the elf comes into your home uh, to report on the doings of children back to the big man in a red suit uh, and is meant to cause mischief and havoc every night in December. And there are many things that I dislike about this so-called tradition, not least that it is yet another burden placed upon parents to manufacture the magic of the holiday season for our children. But I think it also, this it reinforces the more problematic elements of the Santa Claus mythology, namely the whole naughty and nice list idea, right? And it's one of the things, hopefully my children can attest to this, one of the things we talk about is presents are not just given as rewards of good behavior. Presents are given as a sign of our love and generosity for each other. That there is something about the idea of a Santa spy taking notes on kids and reporting back to Santa Claus that reinforces something very un-in line with the spirit of the holiday season. The spirit of giving and generosity and unconditional love. And as we know, the the Santa Claus holiday and the actual holiday of Christ Mass are entwined with one another in a strange candy cane-like spiral <laughs> that are uh, difficult to untangle from one another. And the way that we think about the Santa Claus story and the Santa Claus mythology does, I think, parallel in many ways the way we think about the actual Christmas story and our understanding of what is meant by the birth of Christ that we anticipate in this season of Advent. And I think when we fall into that naughty or nice list, the idea of focusing on Behave, uh, reward or punishment for our behavior. We not only settle for a much reduced and impoverished idea of the holiday season, but I think it also bleeds into a much reduced understanding of salvation and what indeed is the good news that we anticipate in the season of Advent. What is the gospel? What is our salvation, in fact? And this third Sunday of Advent, as I'm sure many of you are well aware of me telling you at this point, is, is our Pink Sunday, Rose Sunday, sometimes referred to as Gaudete Sunday, from the Latin psalm that introduced Mass uh, in uh, the medieval Latin church. And it is something of a turning point in the Advent season as we become closer to Christmas 
and our hope and anticipation moves from that more abstract cry of longing that we heard in the first Sunday of Advent and starts to become more crystallized as we start to anticipate the specificity, the coming and the birth of Christ. And we start to anticipate the re reply and the answer to that longing that we express at the start of the season and, and start to anticipate what God's response to that longing is, what our salvation actually looks like. And we hear that first in our readings today, yet again in the words of Isaiah. As I always say, I love to spend time reflecting on the words of Isaiah in this season of Advent. Isaiah, perhaps more than anyone else, is the voice of the Advent season. And we hear in the words of Isaiah today the movement of the prophet's cry from, as we heard at the beginning of the season, the time of the people realizing their exile, realizing their moment of being separated from the presence and the faithfulness of God, to the hope and the promise of what restoration and redemption for the people of God means. And it is tangible. It is real. It is the reminder that God is, in fact, the God who loves justice. It is the God who comes as good news to the captives, good news to the poor, the God who comes in proclaiming and manifesting liberation for the oppressed and the marginalized. As we hear in the prophets the, the crystallization of what the object of our hope and our longing is, I think it is very important for us to sit with and take note that it is not some hyper-individualized conception of reward and punishment. It is a new reality that we are invited to enter into, to participate in. And our gospel for this morning presents us yet again with the story of John the Baptist. The other, in addition to Isaiah, the other great voice of the Advent season. The one crying out in the wilderness to prepare for the way of the Lord. And it's essentially the same story that the lectionary presented us with last week in the Gospel of Mark. But as I mentioned before, the Gospel of Mark is, perhaps, is the shortest and sparsest of the Gospels. So to, to fill in the story a little bit, the lectionary in its wisdom today gives us not a continuation of Mark's Gospel, because there's not really much else to say, but the same scene from the Gospel of John. The same depiction of John the Baptist. But what I think is really helpful in getting us the story from John's point of view on this third Sunday of Advent, as we are moving through the season and moving through that crystallization of what the object of our hope is, we have John the Baptist who comes to us in the context of that beautiful opening prologue of the Gospel of John. I was just chatting with some folks before the service today that I was so heartbroken to miss Lessons and Carols on Sunday because it meant I did not get to read the opening of John's Gospel, the meditation 
on the word made flesh. I understand Sam did a great job with it. <laughs> um, it's one of the most beautiful passages in all of the scriptures. And I think it is helpful when we hear John in this context today pointing away from himself, pointing to the one, the, the shoelaces of whom he is unworthy to tie. We are meant to be reminded that that one coming into the world whose way we are called to be preparing is indeed the word made flesh, the promise of the God who came and dwelt among us in utter humility, vulnerability, in the weakness and frailty of a baby, the God who is identified and made known to us not in strength, not in power, not in privilege, but in precisely vulnerability. The God who is present with us, not among the powerful of this world, but the outcasts, the marginalized. And that is the truth and the promise and the hope being manifested in this season as we prepare to welcome the birth of Christ. And it is a promise that that's not a reality that we have to make come true. It is. It is the truth that is revealed to us in the God made manifest in the birth of the Christ child. It's the other thing that I really hate about Elf on the Shelf and sort of everything that is tied up in sort of the hyper-consumerist Christmas season, particularly as a parent of young children, is this sense of absolute burden, that there are all of these things that we have to do, feel like all of there, there are all of these things that we have to make happen in order for the Christmas magic to be real, in order for Christmas to come once again. There's our whole checklist of things that we have to tick off, and the shopping lists, and the wrapping, and everything. And as we sit in this season of anticipation, as we try to find those quiet, sacred moments of Advent in the midst of perhaps the most hectic time of the year, it is the reminder that we actually don't have to make the good news happen. The good news has already happened. God already has demonstrated definitively that God is with the vulnerable, the marginalized, the oppressed. God is with us in our moments of frailty weakness, humility. What we are invited to do is to live into that reality which has already been made known to us and to trust that that is the core of the joy and the hope that we profess and that we manifest in this season. Amen.